On the afternoon of Friday 2nd of November 1945, the students at Campbell High School, San Jose, had a lot to look forward to. Thanksgiving and Christmas were just weeks away, which would round off a momentous year that had seen the end of World War II. The Alfred Hitchcock film Spellbound was showing in cinemas, and new-fangled ballpoint pens had just gone on sale for the first time, sparking a writing revolution. Times were changing and moods were lifting, and in the suburb of Campbell in San Jose, California, it felt like the perfect afternoon to enjoy watching a school football game. Had they known how the day would end, it would have dampened their high spirits. By the end of the game, a 14-year-old student would be abducted and murdered. Thora Chamberlain was one of the Campbell High School students looking forward to watching the football game that afternoon. She was a happy, friendly, humble teenager from a close-knit religious family and she enjoyed playing the piano. She had two sisters and their father Frank was the CEO of a large construction company. She was 5 foot 2 and 120 pounds, had brown curly hair and in less than three weeks, it would be her 15th birthday. She had left Campbell High School that afternoon, just before 3pm, with some friends to walk to a neighbouring field where the hotly anticipated football game would be taking place, carrying a cowbell to cheer on her team. Along with the blue sweater, white blouse and red skirt, she wore two pairs of bobby socks. These were a type of ankle sock worn by female high school students, especially those who enjoyed swing and jazz music, a sign of the changing times and the emergence of a new fashion-conscious American teenage culture. One pair of Thora's bobby socks were red and the other blue to match the school colours. Her textbooks and a zippered binder were tucked under her arm as she walked along. California was packed with ex-servicemen who had just been demobbed after war service, so it wasn't all that surprising when a battered blue 1932 Plymouth sedan driven by a Navy veteran pulled up next to the group of girls. The man lowered his window and gestured for the girls to come and speak to him. They noticed that he wore Navy issue slate grey trousers, a white shirt bearing the logo Londonderry Ireland, a purple heart medal and a service hat. He asked if the girls wanted to earn some money as he needed someone to babysit his sister's kids that afternoon. Although it was only for 30 minutes and would earn them an easy $5, all the girls politely refused, but the man persisted. He seemed desperate to find a babysitter and he grinned as he doubled the offer. Thora thought for a moment before agreeing. After all, it was only for half an hour and she could still make the game afterwards. She told her friends to save her a seat and she would meet them there later. They waved to her as she got into the serviceman's car and was driven away. It didn't take long for Thora to realise she had made a terrible mistake. Once she was inside the car, the man accelerated so quickly that he almost knocked down a pedestrian named Ella Baudou who was collecting her mail. Ella looked up in surprise to see a girl in the passenger seat clawing at the window, her terrified face pressed against the glass. She didn't have enough time to get the license plate so there was nothing she could do but when she heard the news later that night she realised the awful significance of what she had seen and went to the police. That evening, Thora didn't return home for dinner. 
Her mother Lois called Thora's friends to check if they had seen her and learned that she'd been picked up by a Navy man for a babysitting job straight after school. They saved her a seat as promised, but she never showed up for the football game. At 7.30pm, Frank and Lois notified the police and then walked the local streets for hours, calling out their daughter's name. Their fears deepened when their calls were met with nothing but silence. It had been procedure to involve the FBI in child kidnapping cases ever since the Lindbergh Law of 1932, and in this case it seemed reasonable to believe there would be a ransom demand due to Frank Chamberlain's role as the CEO of a large and lucrative company. The FBI sent kidnapping expert Earl J. Connolly to investigate, but he was nonplussed when no ransom demand came. The case of the missing teenager was reported in the newspapers, prompting eyewitness Ella Baudou to come forward with her sighting of a girl in distress in a blue Plymouth sedan. Police were also looking at the Navy angle. Six weeks earlier, there was a report of someone breaking into a nearby Navy barracks and stealing a footlocker from a petty officer which contained a uniform. Could it be that the person responsible for the break-in had used the stolen clothing as a disguise when approaching Thora Chamberlain to make people believe he was a serviceman? They already harboured suspicions that ex-convict Thomas McMonagall, referred to incorrectly in some sources as McGonagall, was responsible for the theft. He'd been in trouble in the past for assault and intent to commit rape so it wasn't too much of a stretch to think he could have kidnapped a 14-year-old girl. They showed a photo lineup to Thora's friends, which include Thomas McMonagall and six other similar-looking men. Each of the girls individually and confidently pointed out Thomas as the man who had approached them outside the school the previous Friday. He was 31 years old, 6 foot 3, and when he was younger, he'd been an amateur boxer. He had thick, wavy, dark hair, a pleasant smile, and was known to be a big talker who could easily charm people, particularly women. The police were hopeful to have a lead, but were gravely concerned about Thora's safety. They urgently needed to find and question McMonagall. They were disappointed, but not entirely surprised, to find that Thomas had already skipped town, but the FBI were hot on his trail. The fugitive checked into a string of hotels under different names and left few traces, except at one in Quincy, Illinois. There, he left behind a bag containing a 32 caliber Colt automatic pistol. It was time for detectives to speak to Thomas's wife and search his home. What they found there was damning, the stolen Navy footlocker was discovered in his garage, along with a blue Plymouth sedan, meeting the description of the one which Thora Chamberlain had got into on the afternoon she disappeared. The front passenger seat was missing, as if someone had ripped it out with their bare hands and there was a bullet hole in the door. Mrs Ina McMonagall explained to the police that she'd given birth to Thomas's daughter just a few days ago. On Friday night after dinner, he had announced that he was going to visit his father in East Alton, Illinois, and had said little else. Cryptically, he left her with the keys to the sedan and mentioned that he would be getting a bus to LA, leaving it unclear whether he intended to hitchhike the rest of the way or find some other means of transport. The next stop was the construction company where Thomas McMonagall worked. More pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place when it was confirmed that he hadn't been at work on Friday. However, he turned up on Monday 5th of November and when asked by a co-worker where he had been, he leaned on his shovel with a cavalier air and gave an off-handed reply about being out with a 14-year-old girl. It was obvious by now that the answers lay with McMonagall but investigators were missing their suspect, the car seat, and most importantly of all, Thora Chamberlain. 
Fortunately, McMonagall was already on his way back to California. Finding himself unwelcome at his father's home, he had boarded a bus for San Francisco and in the absence of any other options, had taken an overdose of sleeping pills, either in a failed suicide attempt or as a deliberate ploy to get himself admitted to hospital where he could lie low for a while. What he didn't expect was to be greeted by the FBI on his arrival. Dazed and confused, they escorted him to a hospital for treatment and arrested him as soon as he was fit for discharge. In custody, detectives were faced with an infuriating lack of cooperation. McMonagall offered a series of prevaricating statements which varied wildly from one moment to the next and every time he spoke it was clear he was enjoying being the centre of attention. First he said he stabbed Thora, then he shot her before ripping out the upholstery of the car. Later he claimed to have strangled her instead and even came up with a story about the whole thing being an accident when she was fatally injured after jumping out of his car. Having seen the bullet hole in the Plymouth, it was clear to investigators that the shooting story was the most likely, but their suspect's lies only served to muddy the waters. The only facts they knew for sure were that Thomas was born in 1914 in a tiny 1,000 population town in Illinois and he had grown up alongside eight brothers and sisters. When he was seven, one of his older brothers was killed in an industrial accident at work. As a teenager, he was arrested twice for vagrancy and later for assaulting a woman, which landed him in Illinois State Penitentiary for three months. He had been married before, but divorced in 1943, then married his current wife Ina shortly afterwards. Ina already had two daughters from a previous marriage and just days before Thora's disappearance they had welcomed their new baby daughter to the family. Thomas had worked in various jobs over the years including as a truck driver, security guard and construction worker. He had also worked as a bus driver in Campbell but was fired for hitting his boss in an angry outburst. A few months before Thora Chamberlain's disappearance, he was implicated in the attempted rape of a 14-year-old girl called Andrea in San Bruno, but her family had chosen not to prosecute. It was Andrea who would provide the police with the information they needed to crack the case. Having read about the missing teenager in the newspapers and the fact that McMonagall was in custody, she bravely came forward and revealed more about her close call in the hope it would help them find Thora. She explained that McMonagall had picked her up in his car in San Bruno and driven her to a coastal road at the top of Devil's Slide, a 350 foot high cliff which loomed over the Pacific Ocean and was prone to frequent landslides and slippages, the sharp rocks breaking up and bouncing down the cliff to be dashed into the tumultuous waters below. Andrea had panicked and tried to jump out of the moving car, but her abductor pulled her back and furiously slammed on the brakes. He reached towards the glove box and she took her chance to grab the door handle, open it and run. McMonagall had pursued her and pushed her to the ground, intending to sexually assault her. It was only when he heard a vehicle approaching in the distance that he abandoned his plan, leapt back into his car and sped away, leaving Andrea petrified and bruised, but alive. Detectives listened with interest. Could McMonagall have taken Thora Chamberlain to the Devil's Slide, like Andrea? They led him there in handcuffs and he finally admitted to throwing Thora's body off the cliff. It seemed unlikely that searchers would find any trace of her as the swell of the waves was so violent it would have been enough to tear a body to pieces against the rocks within just a few days. Even a navy diver searching below had been knocked unconscious by a rogue wave. But although they couldn't find a body, they did find a key piece of evidence two pairs of socks, one red and one blue, wedged in crevices on the cliff face, the splash of colour movingly out of place against a bleak and precarious landscape. 
Frank and Lois Chamberlain made the heart-wrenching identification. The socks were Thora's. Police also asked McMonagall where he had hidden the torn-out vehicle upholstery and he confessed to burying it near the construction site where he worked. After an extensive dig, police unearthed it to find that not only was it stained with human blood, but it was accompanied by a pair of bloody trousers and a book belonging to Thora. When they found a bullet buried under a tree in McMonagall's yard, which ballistics confirmed had been fired from his 32 Colt revolver, they felt they'd hit a home run. All this evidence, combined with the socks on the cliff face, was enough to prosecute even without a body. The trial took place on 1st of February 1946. Lois and Frank Chamberlain took the stand to tell the jury about the vibrant, happy daughter who was taken from them almost exactly three months before. When shown the socks and the book that had been entered into evidence as exhibits, they confirmed with deep sadness that they belonged to Thora. Thora's friends were also present and pointed out Thomas McMonagall as a man who had approached them about a babysitting job that fateful afternoon. The jury then heard that the police had received several other complaints about McMonagall attempting to pick up teenage girls outside the school, and it emerged that moments before encountering Thora and her friends, McMonagall had tried the same babysitting ruse on some seven-year-old girls who were walking out of the elementary school opposite Campbell High. Fortunately for them, they turned down the offer, but it was apparent that this predatory killer would have been equally willing to murder a much younger child if he couldn't get his hands on a teenager. McMonagall was far from contrite and pushed aside his own attorney, Bert Schneider, to take over his own defence for part of the trial. While acting for himself, he called four women to the stand as character witnesses who testified that he'd been very courteous when they knew him as a bus driver. He also submitted an affidavit signed by 16 teenage girls which stated, Mr McMonagall is most pleasant in his associations with the undersigned high school students and has gone out of his way to be helpful to us. Eventually, McMonagall agreed to step down and allow the professionals to take over his defence. His attorney presented the jury with a collection of possible explanations that could exonerate his client, including a suggestion that Thora had run away barefoot and pointed out that as her body had not been found, the bloodstains on the car seat and trousers could not be tested and proven to belong to her. The prosecution laid out a much clearer picture of the real events that were likely to have unfolded based on the evidence found by investigators. Attorney for the prosecution John McCarty told the jury how there must have been a struggle during which McMonagall shot Thora after a rape or attempted rape and lifted her from his car and dragged her along the ground to the edge of the devil's slide, a movement which would have pulled off her loafers and loosened her bobby socks. McMonagall then threw her over the edge, and as she fell 350 feet to the unforgiving rocks and waves below, her socks fell off and became lodged in the cliff's crevices. Prosecutor McCarthy declared, In finding the socks, the crime was solved. Crediting this small quirk of chance and the unlikely discovery of the colourful socks chosen for that day's football game as the key piece of evidence that helped bring the case to court. Outside the courthouse, a horde of young women protested Thomas McMonagall's innocence, believing that such a suave, well-spoken, handsome man could never be guilty of such a violent crime. Back in the 1940s, understanding of killers was far less developed than it is today, and it seemed to genuinely bewilder the local community that someone with such charm and bonhomie could be a murderer. McMonagall's superficial allure, his cunning ruse to get Thora into his car, the zealous yet misguided female support that surrounded him, and his insistence on defending himself all hauntingly foreshadowed the notorious Ted Bundy whose depravity would spread outrage and fear across America 30 years later. 
Regardless of the disbelief of the young women campaigning outside the courtroom, the jury were convinced by the evidence they had heard, which included confessions from McMonagall himself. Even though his many stories were inconsistent, he admitted to picking up Thora in the Plymouth sedan. They deliberated for just 30 minutes and on March 1st, 1946, McMonagall was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. He appealed his conviction and retracted his previous statements claiming that he'd been framed, the witnesses had lied and the FBI had planted evidence, but the sentence was upheld. In the meantime, it became clear that McMonagall had also confessed to the murder of a waitress from San Francisco and the only reason the police didn't intend to charge him for it was because he was already on death row. Just before he met his end, McMonagall wrote a statement and left it with the prison warden, which read, I, Thomas Henry McMonagall, in this last testimony to the people, declare that I did not shoot Thora Chamberlain and did not throw her body over a cliff, and I have never made any such confession that I shot Thora Chamberlain in Santa Cruz County. On 20th of February 1948, his weight came to an end and he died in the San Quentin gas chamber. Santa Cruz County Sheriff Wallace P. Hendrick witnessed the execution and told reporters, he threw his head back and gasped three times. Every time he gasped, with that look of pain and death about him, I smiled. I only wish it could have taken longer. But the drama didn't end even after McMonagall breathed his last. Mad scientist Robert E. Cornish had been conducting resuscitation experiments on dogs and requested the opportunity to test his theories on a human body. McMonagall himself had expressed willingness to be Cornish a subject, but permission was denied by California law enforcement, not because they thought Cornish was a crackpot, or that bringing people back to life was impossible, but because it might lead to the reanimated murderer being freed under the double jeopardy clause. During his time in prison awaiting execution, McMonagall remarked that he had killed 11 people. This claim was never verified, so we'll never know if it is true, nor the names of his victims. The whereabouts of Thora Chamberlain's remains is still unknown, but she's presumed to have washed out to sea. She's been kept in the missing persons database in case a body ever services and can be identified. But for decades, a family have had to live not only with the agony of Thora's murder, but with the painful fact that they have been unable to lay her to rest and bring closure to this terrible chapter in their lives. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prasher's Murder Map. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who has been supporting the show through donations and reviews. As you know, the podcast is 100% independent and run by myself and my wife, so this really helps to keep the podcast going and your feedback lets me know that you're enjoying it, so it's hugely appreciated. If you're able to, please do leave me a review wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, you can get access to bonus episodes like the disappearance of British diplomat Benjamin Barfurst and the case of a murderous music teacher with more to come. All the links in the show notes. I really appreciate your support and I'll see you again soon.